Good morning, everyone. Please open your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 from verse 1 to verse 12. You may want to pause the recording at this time so that you can read through the passage. Before we turn to God's Word, come let's pray. Our Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. And Lord, we give you thanks for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that you are God. We thank you that you are our Creator. We thank you that you are our Father and we are your children. We thank you, Lord, that you speak to us. And Lord, that you speak to us through your Word. So, Father, as we open your Word this morning, won't you speak to the hearts of each one of us? Help us, Lord, to listen attentively to what you have to say. Our Father, we continue to pray for our church this morning. We lift up every single member to your God. Father, you know our needs. And so, Lord, we pray that you may meet us at our points of need. Lord, we do pray for our country right now. We pray, Lord, for the leadership of our land. Father, we, think as they, we pray as they think through and plan through the easing of lockdown uh, to level one, that you may give them much wisdom, O oh God, that they may do what is right and in the best interest of our country. So, Lord, won't you open our ears, open our minds, open our hearts as we turn to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 from verse 1 to verse 12. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we came to the end of our sermon series in 1 Thessalonians, Paul's first letter uh, to the Christians here in the city of Thessalonica. But it's very clear uh, that the Apostle Paul had more to teach these believers, uh, that he had more to teach you and I. So he writes them a second letter, Second Thessalonians. The Apostle Paul and his team were greatly encouraged by this young church, who in spite of severe opposition, in spite of ongoing persecution, they remained faithful in their walk with the Lord. And notice as the Apostle Paul uh, begins uh, this uh, second letter, he reminds them of their spiritual identity uh, in Christ, uh, their spiritual identity in God the Father. And thereafter, he encourages them by reminding them uh, that God's grace and that God's peace is with them. What wonderful words uh, for these believers to hear. Uh, these believers who are going through intense persecution, who are going through a very, very difficult time. Uh, what wonderful words, encouraging words for them to hear that God's grace and that God's peace is with them. Friends, the title of my sermon this morning is uh, A Church Worth Boasting About. I have a look there at verse 4 in chapter 1. Paul says, Therefore, among uh, God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. A church worth boasting about about. I guess every uh, pastor and uh, every committed church member is convinced uh, that their local church is worth boasting about uh, for many reasons. If you are to speak to uh, one of them, uh, they would probably give you a long list of reasons uh, why uh, they would boast about their church. But I wonder if the Apostle Paul would support our boasting. I wonder if the Apostle Paul, uh, as he reflects upon our own church, uh, would support our boasting. Friends, as we reflect on this passage, may God help us to understand why it is that Paul can boast about this church. Now, some may argue uh, that uh, he can do so because he planted this church. But then again, we must remember that this is not the only church that the Apostle Paul 
had planted. So what was so special about this church? And as we examine this passage, uh, there are three truths uh, that I want to draw your attention to this morning as we reflect on why uh, the Apostle Paul boasts about this church. The first truth I want you to notice uh, is that this is a church deserving of thanksgiving. Have a look there at verse 3. Paul says, we ought or we should, we feel compelled to, always to thank God for you brothers and rightly so because your faith is growing more and more and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. Therefore among God's churches we boast about your perseverance and faith in all persecutions and trials you are enduring. This is a church that is deserving of thanksgiving. It's no secret that the Apostle Paul is greatly encouraged by this church and his heart is bubbling over with thanksgiving. And notice here that he is thankful for three things. Firstly, you'll notice he is thankful for their growing faith. Now listen to his prayer in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. He says there, night and day, so continuously, night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. And so as he wrote uh, the first letter to them, uh, Paul uh, seems to uh, understand and, and think that there is something lacking uh, in their faith, in their walk with the Lord. And so he prays uh, that uh, this may be supplied uh, to them. And friends, whatever was lacking in their faith then has now been supplied because he is thankful now for their growing faith. Uh, their faith is an overflowing faith. See, but it's important to remember that their faith is growing in the midst of persecution and because of persecution. You see, my brothers and sisters, persecution for the sake of the kingdom, persecution for the sake of uh, God's word, is able to strengthen one's faith by readjusting our focus back onto the Lord. See, when we go through difficult times, uh, when we face opposition because of our walk with the Lord, then we readjust our focus. Then we uh, turn back to God as it were, and we begin uh, to draw our source of help uh, strength and encouragement from the Lord. So it strengthens our faith. But persecution is also a great tester of our faith. And Jesus explains this for us in Matthew chapter 13, verse 20, uh, the parable of the sower as he scatters the seed on these different types of soil. Listen to what Jesus says there in Matthew 13, verse 20. He says, the one who received the seed that fell on rocky soil is the man who hears the word and receives it with joy. Notice that he hears the word and receives it with joy. But since he has no roots, he lasts only a short time. Why? When trouble or persecution comes because of the word. You see that, my brother and sister, when persecution, when trouble comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. And so persecution is a great tester of our faith. It 
it tests us to see whether or not our faith is genuine. What about you this morning, my brother, my sister? Is your faith genuine? Is your faith a growing faith? Or has your faith stagnated? Are you growing in your walk with the Lord? Are you growing in your relationship with the Lord? Are you growing uh, in your understanding of God's word? Is your faith a growing faith? My brother, my sister, I trust that it is. I trust that your knowledge of God and of the things of the Lord are growing every single day, drawing you closer in your walk with the Lord. Friends, the evidence that their faith is growing is demonstrated in their increasing love for each other. And that's the second reason uh, he can speak about uh, their uh, deserving thanksgiving. He is thankful for their increasing love for each other. Again, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12, he reminds us uh, that this is what Paul prayed uh, for these Christians. Listen to what he says there. He says, May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. That was a prayer prayed by the Apostle Paul for this church. And his prayer is being answered. What a great encouragement. Friends, the reality of uh, their persecution reminded them that they were hated and despised by the world. That's why they were being persecuted. They were hated and despised by the world. However, the more they suffered for the kingdom of God, the closer or the stronger their love for each other developed. The stronger their love for the Lord developed. They were increasing in their love for each other. Brothers and sisters, these were men and women who were putting the words of the Lord Jesus Christ into practice. Remember what Jesus thought in John chapter 13, verse 34. Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another, sacrificial love. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is a command for the Christian. It's not an option. It's not something to reflect on and think about. It's a command. By this all men that will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Friends, the world will know that we belong to Jesus, not because of how resourced or how gifted our church leadership may be or our music team may be, or because of how many people come to our church know our, our the world will know that we belong to Jesus because of our sacrificial love for each other. Because we put the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ before our very own. Can you say this morning that you love your brother and sister in Christ more than you love yourself? And so the Apostle Paul is greatly encouraged here because of their growing faith, because of their increasing love. And thirdly, he is thankful for their perseverance, perseverance through suffering. Again, this is something that Paul desired for this church. 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3, verse 2, he reminds us of this. He said, we sent Timothy, who is our brother and God's fellow worker in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. My brother, my sister, trials, persecution, difficulties 
hardships uh, can be a real challenge for the Christian if we are honest with ourselves. It can be a real challenge. doesn't mean that just because we are Christian, we can just easily brush off these trials and say they don't matter. No, they can become a challenge. They can really discourage us from time to time. And so Paul says, so that no one will be unsettled by these trials. And so he is thankful for their enduring perseverance. So my brother, my sister, these are the three reasons why Paul is boastful about this church. He's boastful because they are growing in faith. They are not stagnant in their faith. They are growing uh, through persecution, because of persecution. They are focused on God and the strength that comes from the Lord, the grace and the peace that comes from God. He is boastful because of their increasing love. He is boastful because of their perseverance. I wonder if this is true for you and I this morning. I wonder if this is true for our church. If it is, then praise God. If not, well, then may it become a reality for us. Well, the second truth this morning, he reminds us uh, from this passage, verse 5. He reminds them that God is a righteous judge. Have a look there, verse 5. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled as to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus uh, is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony. He reminds them that God is a righteous judge. Well, two things to note about God's judgment. First of all, notice that God's judgment is just. It's always right. God is a righteous judge. He can never ever make a mistake. He reminds us here, verse 6 and verse 8, that God will judge the ungodly. He says that he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. All those who are persecuting these Christians one day God will pay back trouble to them. He will punish those who do not know God. My brother and sister, to know God is not to know about God. It's not just to have intellectual head knowledge. For even the demons know about God. Even Satan himself knows about God. Even the unbelievers themselves know about God. No, he says he will punish those who do not know God. You see, to know God, my brother and sister, is to have a personal, intimate relationship with him. It's to have that intellectual knowledge in your head transferred to your heart. To have that heart knowledge, that personal relationship knowledge. And those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. See, my brother, my sister, uh, God's word, the gospel, God desires that we obey it, that we put it into practice. And so God will punish all those who do not know him and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. There are many in our world today who claim to be Christian, who claim to know God, who claim to know the gospel but do not obey it. My brother, my sister, if that's you this morning, then I trust that you'll be very, very mindful and think carefully of this. To know God is not enough or to know about God is not enough. We have to have an intimate, uh, personal relationship with him. 
to know the gospel message is not good enough if we don't put it into practice. And notice uh, their punishment there, verse 9. They will be punished with everlasting destruction. Not temporary destruction. Not a destruction lasting for a long period of time, but everlasting destruction. In other words, their destruction will never, ever end. Never, ever. And they will be shut out from the presence of the Lord and from uh, the majesty of His power. Shut out. Friends, the language here, the language of shut out, uh, reminds uh, us of God shutting the door uh, of the ark uh, in the days of Noah and saving all in the ark. My brother, my sister, when, God's, when God shuts the door, no one, no power is ever able to open it. So those who are ungodly, the unrighteous, they will be judged by God. They will suffer eternal destruction and being shut out from his presence in the eternal fires of hell. But secondly, notice verse 5, verse 7, God will reward the righteous. See, God is a, a just judge. He's a righteous judge. To those who are guilty, he declares them guilty. To those who are not guilty, he declares them not guilty. He rewards them, his children, you and I. Verse 5, verse 7, And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are suffering. Worthy of God's kingdom. Verse 7. And he will give relief to you who are troubled. And to us as well. What a great encouragement that is. To know that one day. God the righteous judge will count us worthy of his kingdom. And secondly I want you to notice that concerning God's righteous judgment. Is that his judgment is certain. It will happen. There's no doubt about it. For day is coming, verse 7b and verse 10. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his heavenly angels. We don't know when that day is, but we do know that it is a certain day. It will happen. On the day he comes to be glorified uh, in his holy people, that is you and I, and to be marveled at among all those who have believed, you and I. This includes you because you believed uh, our testimony to you. A day is coming when God the righteous judge will judge accordingly. My brother, my sister, are you looking forward for that day? A day of deliverance. Well, the third truth uh, we need to note in this passage, chapter 1, uh, comes to us from verse 11. Paul reminds them that they are always in his prayers. Have a look there, verse 11. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may count you worthy of his calling, and that by his power he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. What a powerful prayer this is by the Apostle Paul. As he prays for you and I, he prays that God may work on our behalf. I notice he prays for three things here as he encourages us. He prays that God may count them and count us worthy of his calling. See, my brother, my sister, the reason you and I are Christians is because God has called us. He has called us uh, before the foundation of the world. He chose us and he called us to be his children. And we have responded to the call by saying yes to the Lord Jesus. But if you are someone this morning who has not yet responded to God's call in your life. I trust that you will do that right here, right now. As the Lord calls you, just as he called a little Samuel, so he calls you and I this morning. 
Won't you respond positively by saying, Yes, Lord, here I am. Won't you speak to me? Well, secondly, he prays that God by his power may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. In other words, he is praying that you and I may be effective for the Lord Jesus as we serve him, as we live for him, as we live uh, to worship and to honor him. And that this may happen uh, by God's power that is working within us as his Holy Spirit lives within us. As we allow God the Holy Spirit to use God's word to shape us, uh, to mold us, uh, to make us more and more like Jesus. And then lastly, my brother, my sister, he prays that the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified in them as he is glorified in you and I. Friends, the reason you and I live is for the glory of God. We don't live for our own glory. We don't live for the glory of our church. We don't live uh, for the glory of uh, our work or our family or society or whatever it may be. We live for the glory of God. We live so that we may shine for Jesus. Are you shining for Jesus? When people look at your life, when people look at your witness, do they praise the Lord? Do they say all glory and honor go to God? We live for his glory. May Whatever you and I do, always bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus. If not, then we need to reflect upon our lives and we need to change those things that bring him dishonor so that it may bring him glory and honor. Indeed, this is a church worth boasting about. Friends, may this be a reality uh, for us as well as a church and so as we wrap up a church deserving of thanksgiving they are growing in their faith more and more increasing in their love enduring in their perseverance he reminds them that god is a righteous judge he reminds them that they are always in his prayer so as the apostle paul prayed for these believers as he prays for you and I, won't uh, you pray uh, for those uh, who are in our church, uh, pray for other Christians, uh, always be in, in a constant attitude of prayer, praying for each other. May God help us to do that. Come, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Father, we pray that indeed uh, we will be men and women in Christ who are worth boasting about and that we'll boast in what you have done for us and through us. Father, help us to be people who always live a life that brings glory and honor to the name of Jesus. This we pray in Jesus' name and for his name's sake. Amen.